Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Robert Pugash, Medical Director of Western States HIFU and Pacific Coast Urology Medical Center. Uh, thanks for coming this evening. We're going to spend some time talking about prostate cancer, uh, diagnosis, why it should or shouldn't be treated, and then focus a lot of time on something called HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, while I'm talking, please feel free to get up and get something to drink, especially coffee if you're falling asleep, um, because snoring wouldn't be too good here. Uh, so I'll start with uh, just a couple introductory comments. And there are several dilemmas facing people today when we look at prostate cancer. There's a lot of confusion. And the dilemmas that most of us face are, do we diagnose or not diagnose prostate cancer? Should we do it or shouldn't we do it? Should we treat or not treat prostate cancer once that diagnosis has been made? And then finally, how do we treat if we're going to go ahead and do that? Because there's a lot of options. You know, in many senses, it's very easy if you go to a doctor's office and you have a particular condition and there's only one answer. And the doctor says, you need to do this. You have to do this. When it comes to prostate cancer, not only can we not agree on how to treat it, but we can't agree if we should even find out if you have it in the first place. Well, it's kind of interesting when you look at the distribution of prostate cancer cases. We certainly think of this as a disease of older people, but this is kind of an interesting slide. There are certainly uh, older people who get the disease, but look at this. 37% of all prostate cancer cases occur in the 65 to 74 year age group. Uh, a third in the 55 to 64 age group. 10% between the ages of 45 and 54, and even a small amount in the lower age group. In fact, the youngest recorded prostate cancer case so far is in a 33-year-old. When we look at mortality or deaths from prostate cancer, it certainly is higher in the older age groups. So there's an interesting distribution here, and there's a reason why this happens, and it may not be as obvious as it seems, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, when we look at deaths from prostate cancer, they actually peaked many, many years ago. Uh, and this was when PSA screening became much more common. And they got up to, uh, at one point, 50,000 deaths per year, but then as PSA screening became more common, they gradually declined and actually bottomed out uh, in 2014. It went from almost 50,000 deaths per year to just over 25,000. Fabulous success story. And that's when we stopped using PSA as often as we did for screening, and now death rates are going up again. Uh, in 2015, the prostate cancer death rate went from 25,000 to 26,120. Last year, it was close to 28,000. This year, the projection is even higher. So because we've stopped screening as much as we did before with PSA, and because we've stopped treating as much as we did before, we're now seeing an increase in mortality from prostate cancer again. Prostate cancer is scary and confusing, no doubt about that. And there's a lot of information out there about whether you should be tested and how you should be treated, if at all. And that information is very confusing. How many stories have you read about people, sports people, elected people, uh, friends and neighbors that you know, who have had treatment and had one type or another, had good results or didn't have good results from that, or chose not to be treated at all? How do you make that decision? We diagnose about 230,000 new cases of prostate cancer every single year. And this year, roughly 28,000 men are going to die from prostate cancer. And I'm going to leave this slide with this little sentence here. It says, prostate cancer is cancer. And I'm going to emphasize that in this slide. This is not a benign disease. The problem with all the news that's been in the media and all the discussion of prostate cancer is we tend to look at it now as a very, in a very cavalier way. Prostate cancer, it's slow growing. How many people have heard the term slow growing? Right? Most of us. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. Uh, if it can kill 28,000 people a year, in some cases it's not slow growing at all. And even if it is slow growing, if you don't treat it and give it enough time, it becomes a much more virulent cancer. I have one patient who has been on the fence about whether he should be treated or not, and I said to him recently, I want you to wake up every morning, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have cancer. Not I have prostate cancer, I have cancer. Because that's what this is, it is a cancer. And cancer left alone will spread and kill you. Now that may be dramatic, but that's what this disease is. Since we stopped doing the type of screening we were doing before in the era with a lot of PSA testing, there has now been a 72% increase in advanced prostate cancer cases. 72% increase. I called three patients last week and told them that their MRI scans were positive. There was no question the cancer was outside the prostate. 
I haven't had to do that in a very long time. But we're all seeing more cancer in more people in a more advanced stage. Then we talk about watchful waiting. Maybe we shouldn't do anything at all. Well, nearly 20% of patients who are on active surveillance or watchful waiting end up getting treated in the first two years, sometimes because the PSA is going up, sometimes because a, a subsequent biopsy shows more aggressive or more extensive cancer, sometimes because people don't want to wake up every day and say, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing by not having my cancer treated. 50% of patients on surveillance or watchful waiting get treated within the first 10 years. So what we're basically doing in this 50% group is letting the cancer grow and grow and grow and potentially spread, but we're going to get it treated anyway. Active surveillance patients have 6.3% more uh, metastases than other patients who have been treated with either radiation or surgery. Now, once prostate cancer gets out of the prostate, it is no longer curable, period. You can go on medications to slow the cancer down. You can go on hormone therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, <coughs> but you can't cure the cancer. And eventually what happens with prostate cancers, although they respond initially to hormone treatment, they become resistant, they mutate because they're cancer cells and they divide quickly. So eventually it starts to spread. If you are on hormone therapy, it is not a pleasant daily life. You wake up tired, you wake up without mental focus, you have no energy during the day, it is not a very good existence. And we can prevent that if we treat prostate cancer at an early stage. Primary care doctors have stopped doing as much screening as they used to do. Uh, a study at the uh, Oregon Health and Science University found a 50% decrease in PSA testing by primary care doctors since the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommended that we stop routine PSA testing for most people. Those are also the folks that are trying to decrease the frequency of colonoscopies and mammograms. A survey of primary care providers from the University of Massachusetts showed 75% had changed their PSA practice patterns based on their recommendation. So doctors are not even looking for it in many cases now. Now that's starting to change as we're seeing more advanced cancers, but we've had a huge dip and now it's starting to go the other way. Prostate cancer diagnosis rate when someone comes to our office has been increasing because of the increasing volume of cancer, it's easier to find it now. The staggering and scary statistic to me is the percentage of men diagnosed with Gleason 8 to 10 cancers, those are the bad ones, increased from 15% in 2010 to 2011 to 24.5% in 2015. Three years after that recommendation to decrease PSA testing, we have seen a 40% increase in the aggressive cancer rate because we're not catching it when it's not that aggressive. Newly diagnosed cancers have increased tumor volume, higher Gleason grades, and which we believe may translate into an increase in prostate cancer mortality. Evidence from recent studies show an increase in the percentage of disseminated or distant disease at diagnosis since the USPSTF recommendation, which is a very ominous finding. And the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center said if we discontinue screening as suggested by the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, metastatic cases will double by the year 2025. Now, I ask anyone in this room, does any of this make sense? To have gone from the low of 25,000 to increasing now to more aggressive disease, to more extensive disease. Older patients aren't being treated. Older patients are less likely to be screened. And that's why you saw those big spikes in the mortality from older patients. It's not just that you live longer with the cancer. Oftentimes, the decision is made to not treat because you're 75 years old or 80 years old. Well, if you happen to have a family history where your parents lived a very long time, where you are not physiologically a 75 or an 80 year old, but you're active and you have a normal lifestyle, then treatment should be considered as long as you have a reasonable life expectancy. The old concept of stopping treatment just because you hit 75 is no longer valid in my opinion. 37% of every patient who has a biopsy showing prostate cancer has a higher grade cancer or more extensive cancer than what we find on biopsy. This is the problem with making a decision based upon a biopsy. If your biopsy shows two or three areas of a relatively small, slow-growing cancer, you've got a, almost a 40% chance of having more cancer in other parts of the prostate or more aggressive cancer. Here's the problem with a prostate biopsy. It is a terrible test, not just because of how it feels, but it's a terrible test. 
Stop to think for a moment if we do a breast biopsy. How do we do a breast biopsy? Well, we do a mammogram to screen somebody. Maybe we see some microcalcifications, and maybe we do an ultrasound after that. Maybe we do an MRI. We then take someone and using some kind of imaging guidance, maybe another mammogram, maybe an ultrasound, we precisely place a biopsy needle into that area where we think there may be tumor. And we take that area and give it to a pathologist and say, what is there? Is there cancer here or not? If we're going to treat that cancer, and we don't question whether we should treat breast cancer, if we treat that cancer, what happens? On the day of surgery, you may go back to that area where you had the biopsy done, and they'll put a needle right back into that area. The surgeon will then, while you're under anesthesia, cut into that area, take out what he believes or she believes to be the entire amount of the tumor, give it to the pathologist, who will then say, while you're still under anesthesia, it's all out. It isn't all out, I'm not sure. If they're not sure or it's not all out, then you do a larger area. And then when you think everything is done, within a week the pathologist gives a final report and says the margins are clear, the margins are not clear. Contrast that to prostate cancer. We have a blood test that isn't terribly reliable. I'll go on record, I have prostate cancer. I was diagnosed with a PSA of 1.1, very normal PSA. My free PSA was a little bit low, that's why I got a biopsy. And I have a tiny bit of cancer there. Well, a PSA of 1.1, unless we did that free PSA, and most people don't get free PSAs, by the way. So anybody watching this, and anybody here, needs to be, uh, be sure to ask your doctor for that. A free PSA helps us diagnose it quite often. But if a PSA of 1.1 can't show prostate cancer, what, what good is a PSA test? Well, some PSAs are very, very high. Some prostate cancers produce a lot of PSA, some don't. So it's not a terribly good blood test. But if we have an abnormality in the blood test, or if we feel something abnormal, we're gonna do a biopsy. How do we do that biopsy? We try to inject some medicine and numb up the prostate, and then we stick a needle into the prostate 12 times. We can't see the cancer like we could on the mammogram. We're just sticking a needle in 12 times. When we finish that, we send it up to the pathologist and it comes back, let's just say it comes back negative. Well, is it really negative? Because with 12 biopsies of your prostate, we have sampled 0.4%. 99.6% of the prostate is still unknown. That's why this number exists, because there can be areas of the prostate that do show different types of cancer or cancer where others didn't show it at all, so it's not a terribly accurate biopsy method. So we don't have a good blood test. We don't have a good biopsy method because we can't see it. Or maybe we can because we have a new type of imaging study called a multiparametric MRI that we'll talk about. But the problem with multiparametric MRIs is they miss most prostate cancers. And now we don't have a good way to see it. So how can we in good conscience if someone has a little bit of prostate cancer say, don't worry, we're just gonna watch this, we're just gonna do surveillance because we think that's all that you have. Well, we can't figure it out from the blood test, we can't figure it out from the MRI, and we're telling people, don't worry, don't treat this. Not the way we do things at Western States High Food. We need better screening at the primary care level. We need better testing, um, such as the multiparametric MRI that I'll show you later. Genomic testing, which is starting to help a little bit, but we're not quite sure how far to take that and a new concept called fusion biopsies when the MRI is positive. We'll talk about that. And what do we really want? We want less invasive treatment options that allow for a cancer cure without some of the devastating side effects of the older treatments. How should people be screened? An annual digital rectal examination. Now that's not some high-tech thing because it's digital. It's basically the plain old rectal examination, but it should be done annually. And there are many, many, many doctors who have stopped doing that because they're just relying on the inaccurate PSA. Totally wrong. Because we can still feel some cancers when the PSA is normal. And if we can feel something, we should do a biopsy. If your doctor says to you, that's oh, okay, we're getting a PSA, I don't need to check, you say, yes, you do. You need to be checked. If you have a PSA, as I said, you should have a total PSA and a free PSA because this may give a clue when this one doesn't. 
And be sh very careful what the cutoff of the PSA is, what the normal PSA is decided to be by your doctor, because there's an old, old, old way of looking at PSA, which should have gone away a long time ago, that says you can allow up to 6.5 as you get older. That's wrong. The maximum PSA is 4.0. But if you're 60 or under, the maximum PSA is actually 2.5. And between the ages of 60 and 65, it still probably should be 2.5. But once you get above that age, four is the cutoff. So if someone says, it's just 4.1, it's just a little bit abnormal, it's abnormal. I don't know too many cardiologists who would say, your EKG is just a little bit abnormal, don't worry. Forget the chest pain. PCA3 is a urine test. There are other urine tests too um, that have, may have some value. I'm not a big fan of those. I don't think they add a lot, but uh, they can be of value in some people when we're deciding whether or not to uh, do more aggressive screening for prostate cancer. And then finally, the newest test that we've been using is the multiparametric prostate MRI. So this is an MRI of the prostate. And the arrows are pointing to some areas that the multiparametric MRI says may very well have cancer in. Now, a multiparametric MRI is not a normal MRI. It involves a very specialized type of software and a certain agent that we inject intravenously. And the best analogy I can give you is it's like looking outside on a foggy day and seeing the fog lift. Uh, there's a meeting that's held in New York City every June uh, for a lot of us to do these minimally invasive treatments like HIFU. And about three years ago, a woman from uh, London, Claire Allen, introduced the multiparametric MRI to us. We'd never seen it before. We'd heard about it, but we hadn't seen it. And she showed us cases where we could see cancer. Now there's about 125, 150 of us that go to this meeting every year. At the same second, 150 mouths dropped open because we saw this for the first time. But now it got even better because once we could see this, and this is actually a prostate cancer specimen, an actual prostate correlating the actual area of cancer to what the MRI saw. What the radiologists can do now is they can draw a target for us on the MRI. And so here, a target's been drawn on the MRI image of the prostate, and we can send the biopsy needle directly into this area for the first time. We can see it, just like the breast cancer biopsy. Problem is most MRIs don't show this very clearly, but if it does show something, it changes everything. Uh, we're about to get something at Western States Haifu called Uranev. Uh, it is a fabulous piece of software that allows us to fuse the MRI images when they're positive to the real-time ultrasound images in the office so that we can now target the biopsy. We have biomarkers or genomic testing. And in some cases, they can help us detect prostate cancer. In some cases, they can help us make treatment decisions. Um, there are various types out there, Oncotype DX, Prolaris, and Decipher are three of them. They can be extremely expensive in the thousands of dollars. Um, the question is, how useful are they? Because as with any test that's relatively new, we're now starting to put a lot of confidence in this test and say, well, if the genomic test doesn't show it's a very risky cancer, we shouldn't treat it. Well, first of all, remember that 40% of people are going to have more cancer or more aggressive cancer than what we found in the test to begin with. And number two, we don't have good long-term validated data that says, based upon those tests, you can just watch it. Unless you're a gambler, and I'm not a gambler. Not with my patients and not with my cancer. If we decide we want to look at treatment options, if we've made that diagnosis of prostate cancer, watchful waiting or active surveillance. Active surveillance is the politically correct way of saying watchful waiting. The question, if anyone uh, watching this is, who is on active surveillance, to ask your doctor is, what is he or she waiting for? Remember, the PSA is not the greatest marker in the world for prostate cancer. So there's no absolute level of PSA when we should treat. The MRI may miss a lot of cancers, so that may not tell us. We keep biopsying prostate to see if it becomes more aggressive, but remember that we may not catch it because we're biopsying less than 1% of the prostate each time. So what are we waiting for? Well, I'll show you in a moment. We can do radical surgery. Uh, that's not what we're going to be talking about tonight, but radical surgery comes in two forms. The old style with a big incision and the new type called robotic surgery. Robotic surgery is wonderful. It uses tiny openings instead of a large opening. They're less painful, shorter hospital stay, less blood loss, 
faster return to normal activities, less pain. It is wonderful for those reasons. The one thing that hasn't changed though are the two main side effects with surgery, which is permanent leakage of urine and erectile dysfunction. But it's a good procedure, it's an improvement, but it hasn't given us better surgical outcomes. Radiation comes in many different forms. There's external radiation, ERT, something called conformal radiation, proton radiation. There are radioactive seeds called brachytherapy. There's HDR, or high dose radioactive rods. There's something called the cyber knife or gamma knife. A lot of people get radiated every year for prostate cancer. And the estimate is 30 to 50,000 men per year come back to our offices as radiation failures. Because oftentimes radiation doesn't permanently cure the cancer. Now, has anybody read the papers about Jerry Brown, our governor? Okay. So Jerry had his radiation in 2012, and his cancer is back. Jerry is in good company. 30 to 50,000 men per year have Jerry's problem. Because what is Jerry going to do? Now, if you read the papers, it says that Jerry's just going to get more radiation. And that's not true. Now, he may be able to get a little bit more. But it's a tiny fraction of what they used initially, and that already failed. So Jerry's kind of stuck because even if he gets a little more time out of radiation, ultimately he has to make a decision. Does he want to have surgery to remove the prostate after radiation? Does he want to have hormone therapy, chemotherapy? Does he want to have salvage HIFU? Does he want to have salvage freezing? All those are possible. But the bottom line is, if he has surgery, if, he can say, if the bladder can be saved, he will be completely incontinent. You don't have control after radiation, after surgery when radiation fails. A lot of times the bladder is fused to the prostate. You can't separate them. So now the bladder comes out also and you're left with a bag on your abdomen for the rest of your life draining urine. If we do salvage HIFU, if we do salvage freezing, we can in some cases help, but the prostate tissue isn't the same after radiation. It's dry. It doesn't have the moisture it had before. It doesn't react the same way. We don't get nearly the same results that we would have if we used those treatments beforehand. So radiation may not be the best treatment for most of us initially. Um, there's another issue about radiation. I'm going to mention proton here. This is a personal observation. I've yet to see a study about this. I treated five proton failures last year with HIFU. And in each of those cases, I was shocked at the aggressiveness of the cancer. And when I compared the Gleason grade to the original Gleason grade at the time of biopsy, when they chose to have radiation, huge differences. Now, I don't know if the proton therapy is changing the DNA of that cancer, but I'm starting to get very concerned about that. So be wary about radiation in general and be wary about what your options are uh, if it doesn't work. Cryoablation is freezing the prostate. Um, we do a lot of that. Uh, I do a lot of that. We take needles and put them into the prostate under anesthesia and we run something called argon gas through the needles. And there's an old principle in physics called the Joules-Thompson effect. If you compress most gases, they get very, very cold. So if you do that here, what you'll get is a prostate which has ice inside of it and the temperature drops to minus 40 degrees centigrade. We do that twice in a 90 minute period, send you home with a catheter, it's an outpatient procedure. The advantage to that procedure is there's a dramatically lower incidence of leakage as compared to surgery. Most surgical patients have at least a 35 to 40 percent chance of permanent leakage of urine afterwards. It could be a little bit, maybe you wear a pad or two a day, could be a lot where you're wearing diapers and diapers and diapers. But if you have a freezing procedure, that rate's about 10%, so it's a lot better. The problem is erectile dysfunction afterwards because it's the same as surgery. Now with surgery, if we have to take both nerves out, there's 100% incidence of erectile dysfunction. You never get spontaneous erections. If we froze both nerves, the same thing would pretty much happen, although sometimes they regenerate. But if we can save a nerve, Sometimes we can decrease the incidence of erectile dysfunction. Maybe drop that to 90% or 70% or 50%. Freezing does the same thing, but it's still fairly high. And we have HIFU, high intensity focused ultrasound that we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about this evening.
I'll show you some statistics, but in my practice now, when someone says, what's the chance of having leakage after a HIFU procedure? As long as we're doing routine HIFU, not a, a prostate that is riddled with a very aggressive cancer, 3% chance of leakage, 5% chance of ED. It's a treatment that a family member of mine had many years ago, 10 years ago, when his prostate cancer was diagnosed. And 10 years later, he has no cancer, he's dry, he's potent, that's what I'm hoping for when I have my cancer treated next month. There's hormonal treatment, there's chemotherapy, there's immunotherapy, all of which are good considerations. But in general, if you end up relying on these as definitive treatment for your cancer, it's not a curable cancer. We don't want to get to that point. That's why we want to diagnose these early, give definitive treatment at an early stage, but of a type that's not going to give us too many problems. UCLA did an interesting study a while ago. They looked at surveillance and they said, they found that less than 5% of the patients who were diagnosed with prostate cancer, who decided to have active surveillance or watchful waiting, followed the recommended follow-up care, which for them was defined as a PSA test and a doctor visit every six months, and a repeat biopsy within two years of diagnosis. 5%, 95% are not following what they agreed to follow. Surveillance requirements vary from urologist to urologist, from university to university, but in general, it requires, if you choose this, that you must see your urologist every three to six months for an exam, have a PSA test every three to six months, have an MRI every one to two years, and have a biopsy every one to two years to see if this thing is getting worse, if they can find it. Here's how we do a prostate biopsy. We put a needle into the prostate, take out the sample, give it to the nurse who puts it in a container, gives us the needle back, and we biopsy another area of the prostate, and another area of the prostate, usually 12 different areas. In our office, we actually use two needles. So we kind of decrease what I'm about to talk about, and that is I'm concerned that all these patients that keep having re-biopsies because they're on surveillance are having a needle go into one area of the prostate where there might be cancer cells, take it out and put it into another area of the prostate where there are no cancer cells. Are we potentially moving prostate cancer around? Are we potentially spreading it? Should we be using 12 needles? I'm not a fan of Rebiopsy. I think there are some issues with it. Now, this may be a little hard to see, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's my little prop that I brought. This is my favorite thing to use in the office. It's called the Capra score. Like Frank Capra, the director, most of us in this room are old enough to know who Frank Capra was. It was devised at the University of California, San Francisco many years ago. And what they did was they took several thousand patients who had had radical prostatectomies. And they went back and they looked at what their PSA was before surgery, what biopsy information they had before surgery, how much cancer was there, what was the Gleason grade. They looked at all those patients and then they said, how did they do after surgery? Who was cancer free three years later and five years later? And they found some very interesting things. So now in the cap, and I'm, oh, by the way, I'm always amazed when I see patients, and we see a lot of patients in the office for HIFU consultations, that virtually no one has ever had this discussion with their doctor because it's not brought up. You need to know what is the chance of curability when we have our first talk, or when you have your first talk with a doctor who says your biopsy is positive. That discussion doesn't happen. So this says not what if somebody cut into the prostate accidentally and, and did the wrong operation or bad operation for radical prostatectomy. It says if you took the whole prostate out, but in five years' time there was a recurrence, where'd the recurrence come from? The cancer was outside the prostate at the time of surgery. Why did we do the surgery? Because we didn't know that. We didn't know it was outside the prostate. You can't see a cancer cell. You can't see 10 cancer cells. You can't see 1,000 cancer cells. You can't see 10,000 cancer cells. You need to see the hundreds of millions of cancer cells that many of us have at the time of prostate cancer diagnosis. The theory about prostate cancer says at the time, when it first starts, there's one cell, it divides into two, four, 16, 256, on and on. It's exponential growth, and it takes at least 10 years to get to the point where either the PSA is abnormal or we can feel a bump. So if that's true, and we take out a prostate and it looks okay at the time of surgery, maybe it takes five years to see a recurrence. Maybe it takes 10 years. Uh, I have a gentleman in my practice who's radical prostatectomy. I did, it'll be 20 years ago this, uh, this June. Name is Tony. I'm not going to unmask anymore, just first names. 
Um, and uh, Tony's PSA is 11 now. His margins were clear at the time of surgery. You don't have a PSA of 11 20 years after surgery unless there's a recurrence. We don't know where it is yet. It can come back 20 years later. So here's one other tidbit to remember. Whenever, if you have a diagnosis and if you are treated, you must be followed by a urologist forever because we are the ones who are going to figure out if this is coming back or not. Primary care docs do a fabulous job, but this is not their only focus. They're focused on your prostate, on your bronchitis, on your EKG, on your immunizations, and they do a great job. It needs to be handled by a specialist. So Capra says that we give points for the PSA, the Gleason score, the clinical stage, whether it's inside or outside the prostate, the percentage of positive biopsy areas, and whether you're under or over the age of 50. That's on this side of the card. When you flip it over, you find out what it means. It means that the best result you can possibly have is 86% cancer-free at five years. That's my group. That's what I have, because mine is a very early small cancer. That means there's a 14% chance my prostate cancer is already outside the prostate. You can't get better than 14% according to Capra. The next number of two says there's a 75% chance of being cancer-free. So let's talk about this the other way. 14% chance of recurrence, 25% chance of recurrence. 35% chance of recurrence, 40%, 48%, 71%, and 80% chance of recurrence. All that we're doing with watchful waiting and surveillance is waiting for the CAPRA number to get worse. Why would we do that? On a percentage basis, if you go from 14% to 25%, that's about two-thirds. If you go from 25 to 35, that's a 40% increase. Why would you increase your risk of it being incurable? Do you really want the cancer to come back six years later, five years later, 10 years later, or in Tony's case, 20 years later? It needs to be diagnosed early, it needs to be looked at as any other cancer, that it's a potentially fatal disease, and it has to be taken care of in a way that hopefully minimizes any changes to your normal quality of life. So in the past, what that meant was if we were diagnosed with prostate cancer, what were our choices? We could have active surveillance, do nothing, watchful waiting, because we were scared of the side effects of surgery and radiation. There really was nothing in the middle. You do nothing, or you radiate, or you take it out. HIFU has changed all that. Because now we have active surveillance here if someone wants to do that. We have surgery and radiation here, but now we have HIFU. And in our case here, Sinoblade HIFU, because we believe that's a superior technology. Let's talk about HIFU, high intensity, focused ultrasound. Is it a new technology? To answer your question, sir, it's been around for 18 years. First major paper was written in 1999 by Dr. Uchida from Japan, who was a brilliant man because HIFU was never invented for cancer. It was invented for BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia. It's a great treatment for BPH. It's fabulous. It's much more uh, effective than office treatments that we do, dramatically better than any medications that we have, and much safer with fewer side effects in surgery. Dr. Uchida saw something in HIFU that no one else had seen. He said, you know, HIFU gets to the very edge of the prostate. Now, with BPH, the problem is not at the edge of the prostate. It's in the middle of the prostate around the urethra. So Dr. Uchida said, you know, if we can get to the edge, that's where prostate cancers start. That's where prostate cancers usually live. I wonder if we could treat prostate cancer. And in 1999, he told the world, yep, we can do that. It's approved throughout the world, 65,000 plus treatments. We finally got the US FDA to say yes, in a somewhat grudging way, in October 2015. Um, there's a long story about that I can share with you off camera, but um, the fact is we finally have it and we've joined the rest of the world. It is a non-invasive, I mean non-invasive. There are no needles like with freezing, there are no scalpels. It is a non-invasive ultrasound probe, the same type that we use for your prostate biopsy with a higher energy. 
it is, we call it an acoustic scalpel because that's how precise we can be with it. That uses precision focused ultrasound waves and raises the temperature of the target that we aim for to 92 to 100 degrees Celsius in every three second burst. That will destroy the targeted area at the top of that, what's called the focal point, which I'll show you. There isn't a lot of heat that gets past the focal point, so surrounding tissue is preserved. That's why we don't see the incontinence rates that we have with other types of procedures. That's why we don't see the erectile dysfunction. We can stop it by the nerves and not damage the nerves. Remember as kids, you ever take a magnifying glass, aim it at a leaf on a sunny day and see it burn? That's what HIFU is, in a sense. So we're going to focus the energy waves down to a focal point and create heat which is represented here. You'll see that better in a moment or two. How does it work? Well, we have, this is our acoustic scalpel. It's a lot bigger than a regular scalpel. A little cooling system here. And this is the working element here. This is a transducer. It's a ceramic transducer that moves forward and backwards, side to side or rotates so that we can treat anywhere we want inside this prostate. We will ablate or destroy tissue. So we can ablate cancer tissue, we can ablate benign tissue. It's so precise that if we found just a small area of cancer on an MRI, and the rest of it was and on a biopsy, and someone said well, they just want that one area treated, we could just do that, kind of like you treat a skin cancer. Right? If you have a little skin cancer over here, we don't take a big area around it. We treat that one little area. So we can treat focal areas. I'm not a fan of that, and I'll tell you why later, but you can do it. You can treat half of a prostate, or we can treat the whole prostate. We can preserve the nerves and blood vessels outside the prostate that are so important for erections. This is what it looks like. This is our computer keyboard. This is how we control the scalpel. This is true robotic surgery, just like a robotic operation with a, with a Da Vinci, the, the Da Vinci robot for radical prostatectomy. So we can do pretty much what a Da Vinci does sitting at a computer console with this transducer using it like staggeringly precise scalpel. And the precision is what we learn when we do a lot of HIFU cases, and I've been fortunate to be able to do these now for the past 11 years. We will outline the prostate, that's the yellow line here. We'll create or draw our zones on a computer screen, and then we'll start getting more focused on our drawing. So we're going to, each of these dots is an area that's gonna get treated in this part of the prostate. And we see it in three views. We see this sort of called an oblique view, a view from the front to the back, and a view from the side. There's a few of the settings that we have here, but in the end, the computer will know exactly where we want it to treat. And then the transducer will start to fire ultrasound beams into the prostate. In some areas of the prostate, before we do that, we're going to find where the nerves and blood vessels are that control erections. We can actually hear the blood flow that's built into the sinoblate system. And we can map it out so when we're putting all those little dots where we want to treat, we can stay outside of this. Once we start treating, we have a feature within the sinoblate system that is unique to sinoblate, and the other machine that exists uh, does not have this. It's called tissue change monitoring. Every time we fire a beam into the prostate, just before that ultrasound beam goes in the prostate, another kind of beam goes there, a radio frequency beam, and then we fire the ultrasound beam, then another radio frequency beam goes in and comes back and it sees what the change is in the tissue. If the change is really strong, we get orange colors. If it's not that strong, but still really hot, we get yellow. If it's green, didn't get enough heat. And if it's gray, the computer doesn't know. So if we get gray or green with sonoblate, we can go back after we finish an area and treat it again, just to be sure we got enough heat there. And also, we constantly watch these eight images during every three-second burst of energy so that we can change the power level based upon what we see. That also is part of the art of doing HIFU. Average procedure depends how much tissue we treat. If it's a little tiny area, it could take an hour. If it's a big prostate, it could take four hours. I've done some that take five hours. It's done under a general anesthetic. Why do we use a general anesthetic? Because you cannot move a muscle during HIFU. Because if you coughed suddenly, or did this on the, on the OR table because you weren't comfortable. And I was aiming, here's my, your prostate, and here's my ultrasound beam. And you suddenly shift, and I aim a beam here. I didn't get your prostate. I just got your sphincter muscle. So you can't move. So we had the anesthesiologist make sure that you stay still. 
we put a catheter in, either at the start of the procedure or sometimes uh, at the end of a procedure, depending upon where we're treating. Uh, and it can take anywhere from two days to two weeks and sometimes longer to take that catheter out. Why? Because prostates swell. We're burning the prostate at 100 degrees centigrade is boiling. If you hurt your hand and burned it, it would blister. Your prostate swells. Nothing's going to come out for a while. We want a catheter in there. Now, if it's a small area of the prostate that we're treating, that catheter doesn't have to stay in too long. But if it's a whole prostate or half a prostate, you'll probably have a catheter for a couple of weeks. And then once you start to urinate on your own, we know it's safe to take that catheter out. We put this catheter most of the time in an area where it doesn't cause nearly the discomfort or the risk of infection as a regular urethral catheter, one that goes through the penis. This is one that goes in through a 1 8 inch opening just above the pubic bone. Right in the middle, we drop a catheter straight down because it hurts less, much lower chance of infection, and it also helps us know when it's time to take it out. You're in the recovery room for a short time afterwards, then you go home, have a nice dinner, and you're pretty much returning to normal activities and a pretty normal diet later that same day. Now, there's lots of data that we can share. I'm just going to give you a couple of tidbits here. But various studies uh, looked at negative biopsy rates after a high food procedure, 87%. Urinary incontinence, 3%. Remember I said in our, my practice is a 3% leakage rate? This, this is not my data, but that's what my data reflects also. For limited high food procedures, there is 100% continence. There is no leakage. Retained sexual function, 89% in that particular study. Disease-free survival rates, 87 to 92% in this study, compared to surgery of 80 and radiation, much lower. Retained sexual function in this study after surgery was 13%, 76 to 89% with the sonoblate system. Leakage rates almost non-existent. Surgery, tw at least 20% in that study. The reality is it's higher in others. Once again, if we are going to treat prostate cancer, we can now do it in a way where we can minimize the chance of leakage, minimize the chance of erectile dysfunction, while not watching this Capra number go up and up and up and waking up every morning wanting to know, did you do the right thing or not? Quality of life, pad-free urinary continence, two to three years after HIFU, 98%. So that's the probe, this is the prostate, this is the bladder, this is what we're aiming for now. This is a total gland, sorry, total gland high food procedure. And remember we can do a part of the prostate or half of a prostate. So we typically treat prostates in three zones, anterior, top, middle, and posterior, bottom. We can do two if it's a small prostate. We can do four if it's a very large prostate. And so we're going to tell the computer how many zones we want to treat. Once we do that, we have an option of using a four centimeter probe or a three centimeter probe, depending upon the location of the prostate that we're treating. Now we've programmed everything into the computer, and we're going to push a button. And it's going to start to treat these 12 millimeter areas. They're like the size of a grain of rice. One right next to the other, right next to the other, treating this entire row from front to back. And when we finish that row, we're going to treat another row. During the procedure, the prostate will move. It will swell. So one of the things we learn early on when we're trying to learn how to do hyphen, why it takes so many cases to become experienced at this, is to be able to see the subtle changes in the, in the uh, location of the prostate because you have to change where the beam is going throughout the procedure. So your eyes are fixed on the screen when you're doing this. I thought I'd tell you an interesting story. When I first uh, started doing hyphen, it taught me why airline pilots can only fly a certain number of hours because when your eyes are glued to a screen looking at four ultrasound images and about eight numbers every three seconds, after a couple of cases, it's time for bed. At the end, we've treated the entire prostate or half of a prostate or a third of a prostate. 
Um, and it's a, just a staggeringly precise technology. I'm going to close with a couple comments about Haifu Prostate Services, which is a company located in North Carolina. I work with them, uh, as do many other urologists, but uh, six of the leading uh, Haifu practitioners in the country, um, with some of the most experience anywhere in the world, are all with Haifu Prostate Services. And so there's a pretty interesting network that we have. It's the largest network of Haifu physicians and growing all the time. Um, but these are the locations that we have now. And in California, we have a Los Alamitos location, which is where I do most of my procedures. We have a Beverly Hills location. Um, and we have them in numerous other areas. Uh, we have them in Texas now, Florida. We have an absolutely fabulous team of people at HPS who are really focused on patient education, a remarkable nursing staff, financing expert. They really give you concierge treatment. From the moment you decide to have a high food procedure, they will hold your hand the whole way and take you through every single step and they are always a phone call uh, away. There is an online HIFU support group. We have an online patient portal with videos to walk you through the HIFU experience before and after. And there are innumerable resources on the web suite for HIFUprostateservices.com. The support group is a private online forum only open to HIFU patients. And the portal gives you all sorts of information about catheter care, things of that nature. So I'll close with um, some takeaway points. By the way, at the end of a high food procedure, you do pee with a better stream. Uh, once all, all the healing happens, as you should, because all the inside of the prostate is gone. Uh, I believe that all men should be screened every year. Uh, I believe screening should start sometime between the age of 40 and 50. Early diagnosis results in more treatment options with fewer side effects. Make sure your urologist is experienced in advanced biopsy techniques, multi-parametric MRIs, and high food. And ask your urologist how many sites he or she is going to biopsy. If that person says six, go somewhere else. The answer should be 12. I still see people who have specimens left and right. Not the way to go. 12 different areas to help us understand how we're going to treat that prostate. HIFU is an effective form of treatment that allows for a variety of treatment options while preserving normal bladder control and sexual function. Zero Cancer just wrote an article about me, and it's kind of my story. First of all, all the men in here, you know, give your wife a big hug because I'm glad she's here. She's going to tell you, go get it done and everything like that. My wife did the same thing. She was my rock. Um, but what had happened, the way my story started, um, I was going to another doctor, general doctor, got my physicals and everything like that. 10 years doing everything. They called it, to be politically correct, you can call it intuition, instinct, or whatever. One day, um, about four years ago, I was going home from work, and I just literally overwhelming, I need to go see a doctor. I need to go get a physical. No pain, no high blood pressure, no incontinence, nothing. I just. Something inside me, I have to go see a doctor. And so I asked a friend, and they had sent me over to see a new general practitioner. I went and I got a physical, and I said, oh, all blood panel and everything like that. <laughs> they did it, and they come back, they go through all well, my blood sugar and everything, cholesterol and everything. Suddenly they go, well, your PSA is 6.7. What's PSA? It's not a standard of care. So what the doctor was saying, how they're not screening as much anymore. It just happened the doctor I was going to didn't do PSA screening. So they did it, did everything else. And the doctor said, I'm going to give you antibiotics. Take the full run of antibiotics. I'll see you in a month. Come back a month later. My PSA is 8.7 or 6.7 to 8.2 in a month. He says, you should probably go see somebody. Um, and I said, well, who do I go see? And he just happened to say, well, just down the street. You know, Dr. P, Dr. Pugash, right down the street. So he actually had the most gorgeous third year intern do my very first DRE. This isn't Dr. Pugash, this is the other doctor. And I'm just looking like, are you kidding me? So she missed it. She, she didn't feel anything, she's learning. Well, 
I go to Dr. Pugash, and I probably had the shortest DRE, whatever, because he immediately is like, I feel a large mass. I'm thinking, it's probably an enlarged prostate or something like that. Well, he says we should do a biopsy. We do a biopsy, and he comes back and he says that my biopsy is positive. Well, positive's a good thing, right? <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Positive's a good thing. Well, that's not so. Positive is not a good thing. And come to find out, I, uh, I had a large mass. I had prostate and a lot of prostate cancer in a lot of different areas. And so at that point, he starts talking about, we're going to have to talk. When he did the biopsy, he says, we will talk about different treatments. If you want to do surgery, if you want to do proton radiation, a lot of different things. And he just mentioned in passing, they're also doing wonderful things with microwave ultrasound stuff. So as I'm waiting for my results and my biopsy, I get online right away and I'm just, you know, like all of a WebMD and everything else. And I'm looking prostate microwave and everything else. Finally found a place in Canada and they was some haifu in Canada. I called them and I said, well, you know, they have North Carolina. So I turn around and I call North Carolina. I'm trying to get information. And they said, well, who's your doctor? And I said, well, I'm way out in Southern California. And that's this doctor named Dr. Pugash. And, oh, yeah, we're going to him. We're going in Mexico two weeks. We're going down with Dr. Pugash. So they knew him before I even talked about Haifu with the doctor. I've already hooked up with who he's working with. So I felt pretty comfortable that across the country, people are recommending the guy that I just met moments earlier. So. My decision, once I found out, yes, I have cancer and everything like that. Um, you look at all the numbers. Um, I work in aerospace. I've been poisoning my body for the better part of 20, 30 years. Unfortunately, um, lots of us have cancer. Lots of us have cancer. Unfortunately, that's just, I work with, I work with things they can't even tell me what it is because they're secret. But a lot of us have cancer. Um, Radiation was out. I'm just not going to do more to my body. I'm thinking, you know, radiation to me is 1950s technology. I just didn't want that. It, it just seems like we're carpet bombing, so to speak, when we really want to target something. Um, wasn't into a surgical option because I'd like to keep all the original parts as best I can. Um, and you talk about incontinence, impotency, everything else. So I chose Haifu. Um, kind of scary that it, it, you know, it was about four years ago I was diagnosed. It still wasn't approved here. So you're going down to Puerto Vallarta. You're going to a completely different country. Um, he said I had to, you know, from 6.7, 8.2, by the time I saw him, we're approaching nine. And he, he's like, you have to make a decision. There's no waiting, watching, or anything like that. And so... I went down there, my wife is in the waiting room and she's in a foreign country and nobody is actually speaking English. She's scared to this, she's waiting there. I'm upstairs knocked out. Um, literally woke up and anybody who's been under a gen general, it's just a light switch. They turn you off and turn you back on and you have no idea how much time has passed. And it's, you know, it's still the afternoon, the sun's still shining and they basically said, you know, well, get dressed you know, got dressed, um, went back and sat around the hotel, was a little bored, and decided, well, let's go get some dinner. And all Dr. Pugash told me is, if you're going to have a drink, have a glass of water with it, you know, any drink, just make sure you're flushing, keeping water and everything like that. And by the way, the catheter, I loved it. Thank you, doctor, because catheters, you don't have to get up and go to the bathroom at all. It, it's, it's automatic. You know, you can go all day long like, hey, this is nice, you know, especially if you're a frequent <laughs> urinator. You know, it's like, do I have to lose this? So anyways, in the end, we had a wonderful dinner um, that evening with my wife. And funny story, and we kind of, kind of looked up, you know, being people of faith, we kind of looked up. It, it kind of put everything together, we made the right decision, is as we're having dinner, there are 15 or 20 Mexican males that are literally carrying bundles on their shoulder and they're running down to the beach. And we're like, 
Is this some sort of drug smuggling? What the heck's going on? And then they're getting shovels and they're, they're digging holes and they're burying stuff all over the beach. And we're like, yeah, what's going on? And so at this point, we're kind of like, you know, this is kind of unusual. And it just ended up where at the Hilton, they do a fireworks display. And we just happened to be sitting right next to them. So it was the most gorgeous fireworks display and everything like that. And it kind of put the a really nice ending on what was really a scary trip. Um, so next day, Dr. Pugash even bought me a drink on the airplane, you know, <laughs> so that was nice, you know. And since then, um, no incontinence whatsoever, you know, but I do miss the catheter. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and if you really want to know where it is, because you said the pubic bone and all this other stuff, it's your belt buckle. You know, it comes out, they had one that strapped to your leg so you can actually walk around and function normally. And then they have the night bag, which is like this sparklets bottle on a six foot garden hose. So you don't have to leave the house or move or anything like that. So that's really good. Um, the only reason why I didn't return to work, I could have, is I'm an aircraft inspector. I climb on planes and just the opportunity for the catheter to get pulled out they said, you know, you probably shouldn't be climbing on planes, you know, because it's, it's literally sticking out of you. So that's the only reason why I didn't return to work. I was up around and moving and everything like that. So um, it, was, it was a wonderful decision. Um, I wanted to make the right decision because a little footnote here. Um, right before I met my wife, she lost her father to prostate cancer. Um, it was really hard on her. She was as much a part of the decision as me because she lost her father and now here her husband is dealing with the same thing. Um, it was large. He said, I probably had it for over 10 years. I was going to a doctor, they didn't even do PSA testing. So, I mean, I really just, I, I thank Dr. Pugash, Kim Pugash, everybody there. It was really the most wonderful decision I've made. I still see him all the time where they say, you know, keep seeing your doctor. I see him so often that on Valentine's Day, I brought him chocolates, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's just the idea. Um, if you have any questions, you know, either Winston or I, we'd be more than happy to answer them if there's any uncertainty on anything like that. But I still have all the original parts, you know, no surgery or anything like that. And I thank you, doctor, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. <laughs>